Good morning and praise the Lord. Welcome again to Devoted Ministry Church. I am Pastor Edmund Bullock. Glad to be with you this morning. I don't know when you're viewing this, but for us, we're in Central Florida. This is Sunday morning. Um, what's the date? I forget. It's Palm Sunday, the 24th. Right. Sunday, March 24th, 2024. Whenever you're viewing this, I'm praying and my wife is praying with me as well that you would be blessed by this message. So let's go ahead and get right into the word of God. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pray briefly. Father, I thank you and praise you. I glorify you. I pray, Father, that your word would touch the hearts of hearers this morning, that you would speak to us all through this message. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and get right into the word of God. I am going to disabuse some people this morning of some misinformation or some misunderstandings or some confusion, whatever word you want to put on that or however you want to define it. But I want to make something clear at the outset. God is not our romantic interest. Our relationship with him is not a romantic relationship. It's unlike any other relationship. Our love for him and certainly his love for us is unlike any love in existence except his own love. There's no love like the father's love. There's no love like the love of his son, Jesus Christ. There is no love that is executed uh, like that of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says, and honey, you might want to look up this verse for me. Scripture says his love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Holy Ghost pours out his love, shed abroad. That means it's poured out and it, in an expansive way. It's poured out in an expansive way. His love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. There's no such love like that. What's that? Romans 5.5. 5. 5. I think I'll start by reading that, as a matter of fact. Let's go ahead and do that. Romans 5.5. 5. Let's read that verse I've just quoted. Romans 5.5. 5. Let's see here. And hope maketh not ashamed. I won't address that phrase because we're not talking about that this morning. But I will say our hope won't be disappointed. Let's put it that way. Our hope in Jesus Christ will not be disappointed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So we're talking about that love this morning. All right. It's not a human love. It's not a human phenomenon. It's not of here. It's from heaven. It's not of earth. Praise God. It's of the Father. I want to read as my text verse, Matthew, the 22nd chapter and the 37th verse. Jesus is speaking. Jesus said unto him, he was replying to a man who had asked him a question. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Another place where this is recorded, another one of the Gospels, I believe it's uh, Luke, but I'm not going to turn there. Jesus, it, it's recorded as this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus was actually quoting the Old Testament. He was quoting Deuteronomy when he said that. In Deuteronomy, it says, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and uh, I, I haven't read. Look for that in Deuteronomy, honey, because I want to quote it correctly. But Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now let's get into this. All right, let's talk about this. I heard recently, I've heard many, 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 many times, but I heard very recently 
a pastor who was leading a congregation in worship and in prayer. A congregation of young people, actually. Do you have it there? Deuteronomy 6.5. I'm going to just refer to that before I continue that story. Deuteronomy 6.5, because I want to quote it exactly. And I haven't read it in, in a while. Quite some time, actually. Deuteronomy 6.5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Jesus added mind in the New Testament and might is translated into strength. So we're going to deal with all those. But let's get back to my story. So this pastor was leading a congregation of mostly young people young adults, <clears throat> and he was leading in worship and in prayer. And the verbiage he was using, the words he was using, the phrases he was using, the atmosphere he was creating, all of that, what he was encouraging the young people to say in their worship, it sounded very, very much like what we say in our romantic relationships. And what we want to experience in our romantic relationships and how we want to be touched, not physically, but emotionally in our romantic relationships. Praise God. Our relationship with God is not a romantic relationship. The love that God is seeking and that he demands, as a matter of fact, demands. It's not a romantic love. It's not a human romance. We are to love the Lord our God, who is Jehovah, the God of this Bible. There's no other God. So if you have another God that you're serving, first of all, this message is not even for you. There's a different message for you, and that message is repent and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And choose God the Father, God Jehovah, God of the Bible as your God who is the only true God, the only real God, the only God there is. All others are falsehoods. Accept his son as savior and be filled with his Holy Spirit. And having another God doesn't just mean a God by name. For instance, Buddha or, oh, I can't think of any other names and I, I don't really care to at this point. I'm not just talking about you have a traditional other God, a God who is a, has a traditional name, who has an accepted name and a God of a certain religion. I'm talking about if Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior, then this God and the God of this Bible is not your God. For some of you, you are your own God. You make your own decisions and you live by your own dictates and emotions and choices and wishes and, and uh, hopes and dreams. You are motivated and moved by how you feel and what you want. That means you're your God. For some of you, your possessions are God to you. You worship your possessions and everything you do is to preserve your possessions and to gain more possessions. Whatever they are, whether it be money or physical things. I won't go further because I don't want to spend the time to do that. But what I want to say is this to sum it up. If you have any person or anything, including your own self, in the place of dictatorship in your life, that person, that thing is your God. It doesn't matter if you say, but I'm saved, I'm born again, or I accepted Jesus as my Savior, whatever you call it. If you have another person or a thing or an idea or an ide ideology, praise God, or a corporation, praise God, or a political view or a social view on the throne of your life dictating to you how you behave, how you act, how you think, how you're driven, what you do, what you seek, what you hope for, what you think about, what you dream of, that thing, that person is your God. 
And Jesus is not Lord of your life, and therefore he's not your Savior. I've said many times before, Jesus is not your Savior if he's not Lord. He is our Lord and Savior. He can't be your Savior if he's not Lord as well. Praise God. I wanted to make that clear. I said I'm going to disabuse some people this morning, and you might uh, be, you know, take offense at that word. I hope not. It's in the dictionary. It doesn't mean anything violent. But it means I want to set the record straight. I want to make some things very clear to you in this message. But our relationship with God the Father is supposed to be, first of all, based on his own love. We love him, we love him because he first loved us. He has given us his love. And I know there's a word for it, agape. I don't use that word, and I'll tell you why. Not because it's an incorrect word or a bad word or a misleading word. It's not. But you see, I don't want to get, I don't want to create an atmosphere of confusion by using a Greek word that really has no relationship or no relation to um, uh, our everyday experience. I want to talk plainly and clearly about the love of God. The love we feel for others, for people, mankind, our spouses, those who are close to us, our children, etc. That love is fine. That is, we were, we, were, we were created in the image and in the likeness of God. He formed us that way. But you see, when sin, when, when, when Adam sinned and we received the sin nature through Adam, everything about us was corrupted and, 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 and uh, desecrated. Yes, we are living in a lower state than we were created to live in. Praise Jesus. Yet, because we were created in the image and the likeness of God, we still have many of his attributes. One of his attributes is our ability to love. That is of God. However, the love that we experience, that we live in, that we are born with the capacity for, is not always like the love of God. In other words, it's not always pure. It's not always uh, unalloyed. It's not always sing singular. It's mixed with evil. It's mixed with sin. Like, for instance, I think of uh, the young man, the prince, who fell in love with Jacob's daughter. You can read this story later. Fell in love with Jacob's daughter. I believe her name was Dinah. And he, by the, by, the, by the story, it really appears that he really did love her. He really did. And he really did want her. He really did want to marry her. But you see, because his love was mixed with the sin nature, he violated her. He forced her to sleep with him because she refused. And then after he violated her, he wanted to marry her. He didn't want to cast her away. He didn't want to use her in that way. But he, you see, he expressed the, 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 the affection he felt for her. He expressed the love that he felt for her in an evil way. That's us. That's what our love has come to. The love that we uh, was bequeathed when God breathed. His breath of life into us. His own spirit into us. When sin came, it corrupted everything about us. So this young prince, the love he felt for Dinah caused him to, to sin against her. Sin against God. But then he wanted to marry her. He didn't want to cast her away. Praise God. Praise God. That's our love. Our love, love that we know of, causes us to uh, love somebody we're not supposed to be connected with. Or to desire somebody in a way that we're not supposed to desire that person. Or to fall in love and out of love. 
Or to love, some, love one of our children more than we love the others. Or to love somebody more than we love another person. Or to hate somebody who we feel is unlovable or unworthy of our love. That is not the love of God. And that is not the love which, with, which, with, uh, with which we're supposed to be connected with God. We're supposed to be connected with God through love. And it's through his own holy, righteous unadulterated, uncorrupted love. So when, it, when scripture says, when Jesus said, quoting the Old Testament, which he is the in, entire word of God, mm, praise God, in living form, the word made flesh, the word having become human. When he said, you shall love the Lord your God. First of all, he was not talking about the emotional thing that you feel, even if your love does not move you to do something uh, uh, corrupt, uh, uh, corrupt. Even if you have a pure love for your wife and you have been faithful to her for all of these years, kept yourself pure and faithful, even if she has kept herself pure and faithful to you, that is not what Jesus was talking about. You do not love God the way you love your wife or the way you love your husband. That's not what Jesus was talking about. That is, that is not for God. The love we have for God is much higher than that because it's the love that comes down from him that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That love fills us. And that's the love that we return to God. That's the love that we love him with. Praise God. That's why Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, you might say, well, wait, wait, I thought we were talking about love. That's connected. You worship him in that way. You worship him in spirit and in truth because you love him in spirit and in truth. You have his love by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5, 5, it's the Holy Spirit that pours his love into our hearts. And that's the love that we return to God. So let's go further. Jesus said, love the Lord thy God with all, all, all your heart. All of your heart. I heard it put this way many years ago by someone who has gone on to be with Jesus. She said it this way. She said, God has my whole heart. Praise you, Jesus. God has my whole heart. 100% of it. And he distributes his love, the love that he's placed into me, placed in me. He distributes his love to each human individual as it is appropriate by his spirit. So that ultimately, and I, I'm telling you, I'm a witness to this. I can testify to it. Ultimately, the love that drove me to fall in love with my wife when I met her. And that drove me to seek her hand in marriage. And that drove me to marry her. And that knit us together from the beginning. That made me all starry-eyed and gushy. That has been replaced by the love of the Holy Ghost, by the love of God. He has replaced that fleshy, uh, fickle, sometimey, emotional, soft, mushy, gushy love that is here today and here tomorrow, I mean gone tomorrow. I want you close right now, but later I need you to get away from me. I need some space. God has replaced that love, which, let me, let me refer back to this, which is really a corruption of what he put in us in the beginning, but it's not the pure. God has replaced that with his own love, the love that the Holy Spirit has shed abroad in my heart. So now I love my wife with that godly love. Now I love my children with that godly love. Now I love people with that godly love. 
Now I love my parents with that love. Now I love my siblings with that love. And that exchange continues throughout my life. Hallelujah. Ah, the outward man perishes. But the inward man is renewed day by day. It's a continual process throughout my life. And that exchange is going to continue until I'm raptured. So more and more and more and more. Every day of my life. That, that corrupted love. That sin has damaged. Is being replaced, exchanged for the purity of the love of God as I come closer to him, as he fills me more with his love. That's the love that I express more and more and more. That's the love that I expend more and more and more every day. That's the love that kills me. It kills the flesh. It puts to death, ah, the flesh. So first of all, love the Lord thy God with all, all of your heart. Not one part of your heart belongs to anybody but Jesus. Not one part of your heart belongs to any person, any living, living person or thing but Jesus. 100%. It's in scripture. You can't, you can't deny that. You could say, oh, man, preach it. Come on, man. I just read it. Jesus said it. Love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart. What portion does all leave? What fraction does all leave out? <laughs> all your heart. I want to tell an experience I had years ago. This was, oh, now, how long ago now? About seven years ago, I guess. Yeah, about seven years ago. So I was in a prayer meeting. And let me tell you something. I've been on fire for Jesus for years. Years. And my whole life was a life of prayer and fasting and seeking him and just et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wanting him, wanting to obey him, wanting to be holy, wanting to live for him. He was my thought. My, he was everything. He was what I talked about. And to put it in this way, I was into Jesus, okay? Praise God. And I was at a prayer meeting. I was praying and worshiping God. And a sister came and very quietly sat next to me. And she began to whisper to me and she said, brother, God says, open your heart and make room for Jesus. Make room for Jesus in your heart. I'm going to tell you what I thought and felt. This was a sister I love and respect, but I thought, okay, um, that is not even God speaking to you. Uh, I appreciate your help. <laughs> But that can't be God speaking to you, telling you to say that to me. I didn't say that to her, but that was my thought and that was my feeling. because Not because I was so proud, like, what do you think you're talking to? Because I, I said, man, Jesus is everything to me. He's, as I just described to you a minute ago, he's, he's all I think of, all I talk about. Make room for Jesus. And I, I've had the experience in my life of, Somebody coming to me saying that God led them to speak to me or to prophesy to me. And, and they weren't speaking by the Spirit of God. Okay? They were way off. I thought this sister was way off. And I was very polite. I didn't say anything, but I just was going to let that go in one ear and come way out the other, fly out the other one. <clears throat> um, but something about it. When I got home that night and I went to the place, the room in my house where I always went at that time to pray. And I sat in the chair that I always sat in to pray. It came back to my mind and something about it touched my heart. And I said, I said, God, you know what? I, I, I think that that sister was way off. 
I don't think that was you telling her to talk to me. But I, I don't know if I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to open my I, I'm going to open myself to it and look into it. So this is my, the way I responded. I said, you know what I'm going to do, God? Now, I know I'm making this an extended story, but it, I want you to hear the whole story. I said, I'm going to, from, from now on, I'm going to draw, and I had my eyes closed when I did this. I was praying. I said, I'm going to draw a circle around myself, and I envisioned the circle. I said, but it's not going to be a small circle. It's not going to be a circle that's close to me. It's going to be a broad circle, a circle way out, all the way around me. And I said, the space inside that circle is going to be all yours. Nobody is going to come inside that circle, not even my wife, who I am crazy about. I said, nobody gets into this space, Jesus. This is your space. Nobody comes this close to me within this circle, only you. Nobody comes this close to my heart, only you. And for, for quite a while, I don't know how long. I don't know. If, I know it was weeks. I don't know if it was months. I don't know. Probably months. Every time I sat down to pray in that place, the first thing I would do would, would be to envision that circle and to say, Jesus, this is your space. Nobody comes in here but you. This is your place. Nobody gets this close to me, not even my wife. And to be honest, she's the only one who ever could have come beyond that, within that space. And guess what? That changed my life because I realized there was more room for Jesus and there was more space to give over to him and I pushed everything I used to envision this in the beginning I just remember I pushed everything and everybody including my wife out of that space no out out this is Jesus's territory you don't come in here. Let me tell you something that changed my life. Love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart. I completely, whereas I thought I had completely before, but after that, I completely gave my heart over to Jesus. And everybody else gets what he distributes appropriately by the Holy Ghost. What I mean by that is the love I have for my wife is not the same as the love I have for my mother <laughs> or my children or the saints or, you understand, <clears throat> praise God. Let me move on. I was going to say more about that, but that's all right. Let me move on. It's time to move on from that point. All thy heart, all thy soul. What is your soul? Man became a living soul. Bible says God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul, a living person, a living being. That means all of your being is given over to loving God, your entire being. The very person you are. Not who you've made yourself out to be. Not who people have considered you to be or designed that you are. Not who people have told you that you are. Or not who you have come to be because of the circumstances of your life. The things that have happened to you. The things you've done. No, the actual at the actual literal person that you are who came into this world untouched when you were conceived in your mother's womb. And I don't care how you were conceived at this moment. It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. In other words, let's be, let's be, I said I'm going to be very clear. I don't care if you are the product of rape, all right, incest, a so-called mistake, unexpected what have you, when you were conceived in your mother's womb you, womb, you were a living soul. 
And God ordained your being and brought you forth out of your mother's womb. And when you arrived, you had not yet been uh, uh, contaminated by the world's images and, and what people say and, and what people do and what you would do and say and hear and experience and feel and, and understand and be taught and be led to believe. You had not yet been hurt. Your self-esteem had not yet been destroyed. Your pride had not yet been lifted up. You had not yet been elevated to, to the point where you think more of yourself than you ought to think. I'm talking about the moment of your conception, that person, that being. You ought to love God with that entire being. God, every aspect of my being is devoted to you. I belong to you. God said in Malachi, I believe it's Malachi 3, 6, he said, all souls are mine. The moment, from the moment of your conception, you belonged to almighty God. All souls are mine. With that soul, that personhood, you are to be completely and 100% dedicated to God. I don't belong to myself. I don't belong to my wife. I don't belong to any person. I don't belong to anything. And I sure don't belong to the devil. Or his angels. Nobody has control over me because nobody has ownership of me but God. That includes me, myself. I do not have ownership of myself. I do not have, con therefore I do not give myself control over myself which is a farce anyway because if God is not controlling you the devil is there are only, there are only two entities all oh, my soul I love the Lord Paul said it this way once he said if I die I die unto Jesus Christ and I'm paraphrasing it doesn't say exactly this but if I live I live for Jesus and if I die I die unto Jesus if I eat, I eat to glorify God. If I fast, I fast to glorify God. Everything I do, I do it unto the glory of God. If I sit down and enjoy, read a book, enjoy my books. If I sit down and read, I'm reading in the presence of God. I don't enjoy any entertainment that I can't invite the Holy Spirit in with me. I don't do anything that I would think that I have to excuse the Holy Spirit from the room while I do it. I love the Lord God with all of my soul, my being, all your heart, soul, mind. Think on these things, the scripture says. My mind is dedicated 100% to Jesus. Now, that doesn't just mean that I don't think of of uh, inappropriate things. It doesn't just mean that. It doesn't just mean that my mind is not given over to lust, which it means that, but not only that. It also means, for instance, in my politics, my mind belongs to Jesus. <coughs> in my social attitudes, my mind belongs to Jesus. In my understanding, my mind belongs to Jesus. In my mental pursuit, my mind belongs to Jesus. In my imagination, my mind belongs to Jesus. My, in my dreams, and I'm not going to take the time, but I could verify this by experiences. My, in my dreams, night after night after night, my mind quite clearly belongs to Jesus. I don't violate him in dreams. I don't violate my love for him in dreams. In my attractions, my mind belongs to Jesus. In my hopes, my mind belongs to Jesus. In my dreams, and I don't mean my nightly dreams, now I'm talking about my vision, the things I dream of being and having and experiencing in my life. My mind belongs to Jesus. I love him with my whole mind. And finally, my strength. That is your physical exertion, your energies. Everything I do 
It is the glory of God. It is to glorify God. Scripture says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Another verse says, uh, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. All of that is, is referring to loving God with all of your strength. I put my full energy into loving God, gaining more of his love, receiving more of his love. It's what I pray for more than anything else. Uh, 99 percent of the time, if I'm praying, I'm praying for more for the to be filled with the love of Jesus Christ, that I might then return that love to Him. All of my strength. I don't. I don't put more effort into anything. Let, let's put it this way. I'm a very energetic person. And I put a lot, I put extreme effort into everything I do. And the whole time, in the back of my mind, deep down in my heart, while I'm doing that, while I'm putting forth maximum effort in whatever I do, I'm thinking about, I love Jesus and I want him to be glorified. This is the end of my message. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Sister Baxter used to ask after quoting that verse, what else is there? What's left after that? There's nothing else left. There's no more space. Jesus is all in all to you. So let me recap what I said at the beginning. That's not romance. That's not falling in love with Jesus. And his, and his falling in love with you and having a romantic experience with him. And I feel your presence. presence. Listen, I've experienced the presence of God, but it wasn't at all romantic. It was powerful. It was powerful. God bless you.